Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and this is going to be the last episode of 2023. I'm taking a break for the holidays, but I'll be back with more and new excellence. Can you imagine if I just came back with the same old episodes? New excellent episodes in 2024. So be on the lookout for those. I was actually looking at my Spotify wrapped uh, statistics and over 2,800 people have this as their top 10 podcasts and over 500 people have this as their number one podcast that they listened to this year. In fact, I was on Instagram and a whole bunch of people were taking me in their Spotify wrapped results. And the amount of people that listen to thousands of minutes of this podcast is is quite impressive so thank you everybody who tuned in this year and thanks for giving me a listen and i hope you enjoy your holiday season this chat is with danny robashkin owner and creative director at make an animation studio in minneapolis minnesota in our chat he's going to share how he started the studio from scratch in 2004 pretty much right out of school and got his first clients Since then, he's worked with uh, big clients like Xbox, Dunkin' Donuts, Adidas, and McDonald's. He's also going to highlight the new path Make has been on with creating its own original micro short series for social media. He's going to explain everything that goes into them and uh, what he he hopes to get out of it. So without further ado, let's jump in. Hello, Danny. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing doing good. Um, it's, It's... I guess it's finally time we chatted. <laughs> it's Definitely. been a while. Um, okay, so uh, I was wondering if we could start things off by just, you know, explaining who are you? Who are you? Who are you? What do you do? Well, I do a lot of different things. Um, technically, I title myself as creative director here at Make. Okay. Uh, but basically, my interests are... Um, Well, one of the reasons that Make does as many different types of projects as it does is because I'm interested in 2D animation, 3D animation, live action, motion graphics, visual effects. So we really try to um, have projects that do all of the above, uh, currently with a bit more of a focus on world building and storytelling. So um, I kind of oversee, I oversee all of that and... um, yeah, that's kind of my so, idea is bouncing around a lot. So that's interesting to me because I talk to a lot of studio owners kind of similar size to you. And, uh, you know, they try to follow, I guess, follow the money, if that makes sense. You know, like uh, maybe maybe like integration with like, um, I don't know, some like Unity or like whatever is, is trending right now. So they'll be like, okay, we're going to add that to our plate. But mm-hmm. what you just said is you kind of, you, whatever you're interested in, you try to test out and experiment and and build uh, a business out of that. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that would actually be pretty accurate. I think um, so, you know, you can kind of do anything, right? Like if you want to do Unity or, or kind of real like time, you can, you can pursue that. Uh, if you want to do live action, I mean, there's enough like projects and interesting things to do out there that touch on any one of those things. So I think that if you like new challenges, like trying out new things, uh, always doing, j- just do those and then try to do them in a way that is at least somewhat marketable, that will some way be able to translate into work as well as fun. Right. So how do you, okay, so what, the landscape is like pretty competitive. There's tons of studios, there's studios that specialize in like special effects or live action or whatnot. Mm-hmm. How do you compete with those studios when you're, uh like are you worried about spreading yourself thin or you know dabbling in something where you're not an expert and then you know uh bidding on something and Mm -hmm. you know making a fool out of yourself or something but not a fool out of yourself but you know what i mean like you know master of none or yeah yeah definitely um so i think a thing that we've kind of gone through a little bit uh with make over the last couple years really has been what do we what do we do as a studio like who are we what's our identity you know what what does it mean to what does it mean to be made because when we first started the idea was just i liked everything uh i went to school to do like animation and visual effects but i went to uh, the minneapolis college of art and design basically as part of that program you do also drawing and painting and photography and filmmaking and i don't know 
furniture built. I mean, like literally a, a little typography. I mean, every time I learned one of those things, it was like really interesting to me. I was like, oh, I could do this. This is like yeah. the thing I could do, right? Like every time I took a new class. And uh, it just happened to be that I ended up uh, doing an internship at a commercial studio here in town uh, between my junior and senior year. And I realized that when you do commercials, there is a type of studio that does all of the above. If you do the entire commercial, well, you're kind of by definition, you're, if it's live action, you're shooting it, maybe you're adding visual effects to it, you're adding some supers and graphics, so there's a motion graphics component to it, and different projects will have different ratios. So that's really kind of how I got into commercial work in the first place, was uh, kind of an outlet to be able to do all mm. these different things that I learned that I thought were particularly interesting. Now, that being said, um, that's where we started, but definitely as the studio has grown, uh, you'd ironic, like we always kind of maintain that we've always done all of the above kind of a thing. And I always thought that that was really great, but definitely when you start to get to these, um, you know, higher end projects, things are a little bit more complicated. Um, you need to kind of start forging a little bit of an identity just being like, yeah, we do a little bit of everything. Uh, it doesn't quite work. So the trick over the last couple of years has been, well, how do we focus ourselves a little bit, but don't focus ourselves so much that all we're doing is the exact same project again and again and again. And it's kind of, you know, right. boring essentially. Um, and that's where kind of the idea of focusing on storytelling, world building characters and stuff like that has been kind of the driving force of our work over the last, uh, couple, um, Sorry, over the last um, yeah couple of uh, couple of years. Yeah, yeah, interesting because you know you said you wanted to dabble a little bit in everything and you were trying out everything. I mean, like make in the early days, you were you know you you tried stop motion, you did two D, you have live act, you did you did every type of animation essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, what you know instead of going like we're only going to do like CG animation or or stuff like that. Like, what made you focus on story and character? Like when you when you said, you know, you're interested in everything, what made you focus specifically in that? Why do you think it's going to be success? Uh, so I, uh, one of the decisions I ended up making was let's not choose, oh, we're a 3D animation studio or we're a 2D animation studio or we're, a, you know, I didn't want to do that because I really do like doing a lot of these different types of animation. I think that's what really makes it interesting. So I wanted to keep the variety of projects, but I was like, What's the, what are the best projects, right? What are the most interesting projects? What are the most complicated projects? And I think if you start thinking about a project where you need to come in you need to build a world, you need to build uh, characters, you need to have like reason for all of this to come together. You need all these different disciplines. Now you're not like a student that does a bunch of different things just because this project is this and this project is that. But now you're bringing all the different skills, all the different abilities into what is probably the most complicated type of project. And right. those are the projects that, you know, the most complicated ones usually will have higher budgets and they'll, they're usually more challenging and more interesting. So, you know, that's kind of where we want to push the work. I mean, that makes sense. Instead of being like, you know, we do backgrounds on a bunch of stuff and then we do like characters over here. You can just be like, we have a cohesive strategy where we do the whole thing um which is which is i guess you're you're making me think of like films essentially and tv mm -hmm. shows because that's what they do but i have another question you know uh running a studio how, like there's a lot of pressure for you to pick the right strategy to keep things going in the right direction do you have like a board or a mentor or a group of consultants or are you just like Here's based on my experience, uh, and I'm just going to make a bet in this area. And if it doesn't work out, hopefully we have enough in the cash cow to keep to go a different way. Because because that's a lot of pressure just to figure things out by yourself, you know. Uh, so it would be the latter. Yes, there isn't like <laughs> uh, there isn't. There isn't like we're not big enough to have a board and multiple consultants. And well, stuff I don't like know. That. Maybe you uh, have a you know, whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, you have some time. Yeah, so we're not we're not there, um, and I don't know that I even necessarily want to be there. I think what I like is is that we're at a place where we're nimble enough to be able to try something. If it doesn't work, we can do something else. If that doesn't work, like you know, I'm not like 
married to any one of yeah. these things, but I definitely want to try and make them work. Uh, we do now have uh, meetings within the studio where people that, you know, have more kind of seniority and responsibility and have expressed interest in, you know, being part of the, the why uh, of what we do, not just the what, um, you know, just being able to bounce stuff off of them. Uh, at the end of the day, I feel like any of the moves that we've ever done as far as like the type of work that we're pursuing or side projects or any of those types of things, I feel like they're never frivolous. They're never like, okay, we're doing like a 180 here and now we're completely like unrecognizable. I feel like usually what ends up happening is we're like, okay, what if we do a little bit more of this, right? So yeah. if I say that we're focusing on worlds and stories and characters and building all that out, doesn't mean that we don't do any of the other stuff. We're just maybe not emphasizing it quite as much. So it's doesn't it never feels like such a dramatic shift that we need to like explain it very we have to like so I explain it to everyone and we're throwing away a bunch of like the what existed before it's just that you kind of slowly find yourself moving in this other direction and then hopefully two three years later if it works you've changed you're now you're now a little different you're doing yeah, yeah. so fast forward two or three years later hopefully things have changed you've gone in the right direction what is it what does it look like what kind of clients are you bringing in at that point or what kind of projects are you working on mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, honestly, we're already kind of seeing like right. the, the effects uh, start to happen. I mean, we find so much more now that clients come to us. Uh, you know, we're still if we're still a vendor, right? But um, we're part of a lot of the creative discussions. We're um, we're kind of we're we're talking both to the clients. Uh, we're, we're kind of understanding the client's perspective a lot more, I guess, would be the way I would look at it. Uh, so that we can make better decisions about whatever artistic thing we do. You know, when you're kind of a little less experienced, you find yourself like kind of doing it because it looks cool or because right. it's fun to do or something. And after you spend more time uh, talking to clients, you start to realize that the more you understand them, the more you can make better choices and better, better decisions and shape the artwork to do exactly what they want to do. Uh, so I find that like the elevated discussions that we're part of um, are kind of increasing the interest to, of the projects. Uh, almost all the projects that we do now are kind of, you know, we come in very early and do the whole project. It's very rare now that we're like just doing a specific part of it or a certain component. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's our, our, are all the projects really taking advantage of that right now? No, but we're definitely seeing a bias uh, start uh, start to shift in that way. Interesting. I mean, this makes sense to me. And, and you know, that clearly, I think, gives you a competitive edge, at least against all the new studios popping up all the time, because they don't have that, you know, experience. And like you said, maybe they want to do things because it looks cool or it's fun versus like if you have a, a more integral understanding of the client, then... Mm -hmm then it would be faster and easier and you'd be more on the same page with pitching them anyways. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things where it's surprising how um, understanding like some of these smaller nuances, like it's really just changing what you're doing a little bit, but understanding that difference it has a dramatic change across like so what the would entire be like an project. example of, of something that, that like a small change had a dramatic effect on how you... How you did things. Um, so, I mean, kind of like I was saying uh, about talking to the clients, I think yeah. uh, m maybe earlier on, I don't, I'm, I'm going to use hyperbolic language here, but like right. <laughs> <laughs> you find yourself sometimes a little more adversarial to the client, right? Because mm. if you're like, I want to do something cool and I want to do something awesome and this and that, and the client has a certain, like, you feel like the clients are kind of like, no, no, make it like this. No, no, make it like that. And you kind of leave a lot of projects thinking, Oh, uh, it could have been, looked so much better. Oh, it could have been oh, like this other thing or whatever. Like you kind of have that attitude. And it's easy early on without experience to kind of think that you know better. Right. I would say the biggest thing that we figured out is the clients do know what they're doing. There's a reason why they're there and why they're doing that. Uh, and 
the more that we deal with them and understand like their creative needs, the more it becomes clear. That's why it should be like this. That's why it should be like that. And a lot of these things that maybe in the first few years, I would have been like, oh, this is so stupid. Why is it like this? Uh, now I just do intuitively the way that they wanted to, because right. I understand like, what's the concern here? What's the consideration? And you don't have like these kind of preconceived notions that you sometimes will come into a into a situation with. So okay. yeah, I don't know if just not having preconceived notions and having more empathy for the client. I mean, I know it sounds small, like, right? You say that it's like, oh, just, just change this, right? But that's one of those things. Yeah, you just like change that dial a little bit and now things are very, very different as far as your approach. No, it makes sense. You're bringing me back to my vitamin and supplement business days when, you know, I was I was a market analyst and we had ex we had extensive research on our demographics. We knew what they ate for breakfast, their routine, like who they are, mm -hmm. how many kids, like all this information. And then once in a while we go, you know, we'd put together a creative brief with an agency and they come back with these sometimes crazy ideas and be like, no mom who's getting her kid ready for school yep. is going to care about this. So do you ever yeah. get um, the demographical information from a company and they're just like we want you know this is this is who we're making this for and then and then you build it yeah. more for that okay that makes sense yeah if we're doing so if we're doing kind of a a creative from the from the ground up right where we're coming up with like ideas and scripts and stuff like that then definitely we get that yeah. um if we're coming in after the concept has kind of been pitched right. and we're more in the like refining the storyboard phase of the project um we'll probably get like the the you know thirty thousand foot view of the audience so that we kind of understand what they're doing and then it's our job when we're having a conversation with a client to kind of dig into some of those questions and that's another thing that uh in the past like we want to talk about a small difference right um in the past i was kind of on calls and i felt like i just needed to be like yep this is clear. This is obvious. No problem. Great. Yep. Yep. I got it. Like, don't worry, guys. And then have to go figure it out or whatever. And now I actually find myself uh, asking a lot more questions, mm. essentially not um, not imagining that I know the answer, but trying to dig deeper in order to understand what are the reasons that like how did they get to the creative that they're giving us instead of just being like there's the creative how do i execute it right because if i understand why they're doing what they're doing then when i execute it that's one of those things that helps us not get into that conflict where well i wanted to make it this way but you had this whole other agenda uh over here that i was kind of um in the dark about but not like in the dark because you, you kept me in the dark but just because i wasn't inquisitive enough so now hey, listen, they could have they could have given you more information in the first place well, i think I mean, that's just they, how naturally things go they're like here you go animate it come back <laughs> so so here yeah but here's the thing right i think that we all fall into this trap of we know what we know we don't know what somebody else doesn't yeah, know necessarily yeah. so sometimes we'll just go out there and we'll say something and we're giving someone like if we know 100% of the information, if we are doing a brief, we're giving someone maybe 50%. And that's being generous, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's not because we don't care or there isn't time or any of those things. It's really just a matter of it's hard to keep track of all the things that matter. And you don't sometimes, like some things, if they've been with you for a while, they seem obvious. So if a client doesn't tell me every little nuance about like what the mom does in the morning. And then I come up with an idea that involves, um, I don't know, dinosaurs that has like nothing to do with what the mom cares about in the morning. Like uh, that's just because they have lived with that information maybe for four months as they were working on concepts and back and forth with the client that to them, they can't imagine it being anything else. Like, well, is it this obvious that it's like that? So it's not like their fault for not, remembering to give that information but it is the responsibility i think of the person receiving to kind of think okay do i know why this is happening do we know what the motivation of this character is like you yeah. kind of have to ask those questions because when you're when you want to go do something you need to have a reason for it and you're the one that knows 
am I doing it for the reason that they gave me or am I doing it because it's either a generic idea or it's just what I would like to do? That's the difference, I think. I mean, fair. Did you ever think, you know, when you were at MCAD, I'm assuming that's how you call Minneapolis College of Art yes. and Design, that you'd yeah. be years later in meetings thinking about how to deconstruct a brief to to enhance your communication? <laughs> No, because you do what essentially kid knows that, right? right. You know, there's so, no. So how big is make is right this. now? How big, like, uh, as in, as in, like, employees, like full time employees? Yeah, I think we're at about thirty, just over thirty now. Okay, maybe 30, 31, 32, and we'll usually have you know a handful of interns or something nice. like. I that. I mean, that's that's incredible to have like two dozen people full time for you. Yeah. So, so bring, me, more, bring me back. I'll just say that's more than the initial plan was. The initial plan was let's cap it at 25. I can't uh, imagine having any more people here than 25 people. So now you're like, okay, fine. Bring in another one. Okay. <laughs> well, no, we decided at some point a couple of years ago that we want to do bigger, better, more. And yeah. then we're like, okay, well, uh, I think 40, 45 is probably also okay. Okay. So okay. That's so the, that's the there. next. Uh, that's the next goal. Yeah. So you're hiring ten more people right now to get to the next goal. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe we'll a, a couple a year, a few a year. We'll see. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. How so br goes. so yeah. bring me back to you know young Danny in school at his first internship, realizing that a commercial studio can touch a lot of your interests. How did you go from I'm taking these cool courses and electives to now I'm seriously making a bet to build a studio and how how did you know how do you do that as a 20 something year old from school? yeah so yeah 20 i guess 22 yeah it would have been 2004 yeah 22 um well so i have the the fortune of uh being a child of uh a privilege and i had great parents and uh they uh you know, they gave me a lot of what I needed. Uh, so for me, it wasn't like that much of a risk to, mm -hmm. while finishing school, be part of the the beginning of the studio. Um, it was basically, my, my only risk was I have to leave the job that I have. And uh, if it doesn't work, I delayed the beginning of my career by right. however long it would take to realize that it's not working. Like if it didn't work after... Three months. I'm like You're still delaying right. the beginning of your career today. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, am I still? Maybe you know. Maybe I'll realize uh, next year. Like, oh shit, what have I done? Uh, now I have uh, 20 years uh, to uh, make up. But uh, no. So for me, it really was kind of like a, a low risk uh, situation. I was really okay. Be perfectly fair. I, mean I was really, I was really lucky about that. But I will say that. Um, there was a point where you're kind of like, well, do I do I go do this thing that who knows what's going to happen with it? And do I can I contribute? Can I be the the kind of person that, you know, will make it a success? Or do I'm just like, this is crazy. Let's just stay here working, you know, just doing my job and it'll be OK. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a couple of like lessons I learned uh, earlier in my life that I really regretted not taking the risk, not, mm. uh, you know, not trying to go beyond what I felt entirely comfortable doing. And I very much regretted not doing those things, uh, looking oh, back. Wow. Okay. So this time when it came back, it was an easy, I was like, uh, do I want to? Yes, let's do it. You know, wow. like I, I didn't really have to think about it very much. Cause I just made, I made that commitment to myself. Like, don't, don't chicken out. Like, don't, don't feel shy don't feel afraid like don't let any of those kinds of things um like don't let it don't don't, don't let those things stop you basically so yeah I mean, it was an easy let's do it okay that, i mean that sounds great i'm and you know it's it's fortunate you had you know parent support and these previous experiences that you go all in but still like you know you're fresh out of school you have an internship you're not you're you have no you you have some connections but like you know how did you get your first client and also make was making make was making huh from the start very like high quality stuff even mm -hmm. in 2004 so how did you convince your first client and uh get like what was the what was the business strategy mm -hmm. or whatever back then when you're just nothing 
Well, I mean, I had a couple of partners when uh, the studio started and they had years of experience that I did. So they have. weren't also like classmates that you knew they were. No, no. These were people I met at the studio that, oh. I, that I worked at. So these are people that had, um, you know, 10 years of experience for one right. of them, seven years for of the other. Okay. Okay. I think. So, you know, people that had some of that experience, but um, were never really on the 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 sales side, you know, still we're talking about artists. And I think that, you know, things were a little, maybe a little different back in like early 2000s where there weren't quite as many people right. doing this now. Like there are now tons of people will have like these like two person studios or three person studios, uh, software is, you know, super cheap now. Uh, hardware is pretty cheap. Uh, in order to get stuff done, tools, the, the education, like just tutorials and resources and assets. So, you know, there was still at that time a bit of a premium for like there weren't that many people that could do it. Um, so we kind of had that going for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just kind of believed in ourselves, right? So we basically like took like our personal reels clutched it together into a company reel, made it clear to everyone that this work is work that we did in other places. This is like our reel. We were very honest about that up front because we didn't hmm. want to pretend that we're showing like, oh, these are our clients. We want to really make sure that it's focused on the work and then um, go out, pitch ourselves, explain why, you know, a group of focused people are the right fit for the project. And then you just kind of like, you know, you get a project, you get another project. Now right. you can start building your reel. So it takes time. It takes a little bit of work. Uh, we didn't come from, you know, this isn't the kind of thing where it's like, oh, superstar lead animator from one company and like creative director from this company and whatever. And they all have tons of client connections. And then, you know, they come together and they're basically at the, you know, even at the very beginning, they're basically just running. Uh, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of convincing. It, you know, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't take any salaries really at the beginning in order to be able to kind of give ourselves more more runway. And uh, you know, it's uh, think about like any any like role playing game where you you start small and you just start. You know, yeah, you're an orphan away, on a farm on a farm. <laughs> yeah. And you're grinding away. So, you know, having just enough connections, having just enough elbow okay. grease from the people involved. And, yeah. you know, when we got there, we did it. So a lot of studios, you know, they their first clients are like things they would never take years later. But it was just like, it, it was, you know, work that got the lights on and their foot in the door and a reel mm -hmm. together. Was it kind of like that too? Where you're like, I don't know, designing a graphic for somebody here and doing a mom and pop pizza shop uh tv no, no, the, the the clients were were legit pretty much from day one yeah um i will say that we probably did a lot more uh corporate videos at mm. the very beginning like these kind of like two three minute videos that are meant for a trade show or for a website right, or right, for right. an event or you know things like that these are like really long versus the like shiny 30 second commercial um that's probably the only thing that we don't really do that much uh anymore like we don't do okay. the longer corporate videos almost everything is like a commercial or uh, uh something meant for you know social that's like really tight really compact kind of trying to get as much production value into like i, I call it like dollar per second on screen uh right. essentially um and I just prefer doing those because of that point. Like you get to make something that looks kind of as good as you can instead of trying to stretch it across like a really long. Uh, totally. Project. That's always a quip I have with commercial TV commercials. It's like, even the ones where it's like a character animated from a TV show, the TV commercial, like Flintstones character will be like shaded, animated, like so fluid. And then you watch the Flintstones and it's like, <laughs> I don't know, it's on, it's on eight. <laughs> yep we did one of those uh yeah but that's uh, fun i mean it's fun to like do like do the absolute best uh flintstones that you can do right like it's the nicest course, it's just the course. nicest flintstones but there's again there's the whole thing about like how 
there's all the rules about those characters and it gets very specific you know the characters kind of change through the generations so it's like are we doing uh the character from like this year five years ago right. are we going nostalgic and right. they have all sorts of guides about that and stuff so it's really oh my fun. gosh well if you ever do scooby-doo there's a whole lore on <laughs> it's like there's like competing lores on who's what and what <laughs> did we do i feel like we did some kind of scooby-doo burger king well, there you go. Like uh, a decade ago or something like that. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't even remember. We did so many of those. Okay. It, was, so, okay. it was really funny. <clears throat> One question I'm always interested in when I talk to Studio Zero Size is like, how do you get clients? Because like, it's mostly just through word of mouth or agency connections or blah, 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 blah. blah. Like, but you said you're trying to go in a new direction with mm -hmm. your creative work. So you can't essentially go back to the same old bread and butter clients unless they're also looking for that type of work too so how are you you know how are you getting new clients that want the the cohesive background character story stuff mm -hmm. uh so we're technically not doing anything different than what we did previously other than when we talk to them and when we show them the work gotcha. uh, we put an emphasis on that so um it's still going i mean we there weren't any clients that we like explicitly didn't go to uh, previously. Um, it's really just a matter of like, uh, yeah, just how we present ourselves to them. And then hopefully as our work gets like kind of more focused and people see more of it and we uh, hopefully build kind of a reputation off of that, um, we'll be working with them on bigger and better projects. Uh, so how, how common is it for, for a new company to, to, to slide into your DMs and say like, hey, we really liked your work on, I don't know, X, Y, Z, wondering if you could do something. Is that a, is that a common or experience? You know, it's, yeah, it doesn't happen so much. Uh, it's happened like a few times, basically yeah. based off of some things on, you know, like uh, the Make Gallery account or something like that. Like right, right. Because be like, for a oh. while, you know, you were really building a, fo like before Instagram's algorithm, like trashed every yeah. art account, you were really building a following. And, and so I was, I was curious, uh, you know, how that paid off. Yeah. So there were definitely quite a few uh, people that were like, hey, I really like this uh, project that you have here. We want something in that style. Uh, there were some people that were just like, I just love your account. Let's talk. And there were a lot of times where um, the account was used as kind of like a, like a real piece, hmm. essentially, right? Because if clients are looking to get like social work done, we're like, all right, here's examples of us doing social work like stuff that is meant for uh social purposes it also doesn't hurt that there's so many different styles there that if someone is like oh do you do like mixed media or something we're like go to the instagram just scroll through that you know this is all done by artists and you can see there's every different style here yeah. uh so it worked out uh really well for stuff like that as well um going into the future um, you know, we just started doing uh, make originals on YouTube. My hope is, is that that becomes kind of what the make gallery account was on Instagram to us doing those kinds of commercials um, when people will hopefully just find us through the original animation on right. YouTube and then be like, okay, we love what you guys did with like this, like micro short series. Uh, we want something similar for product so-and-so. So, -and -so. so totally. that's definitely an ambition for that as well. Yeah. I mean, I, tell me about Make Originals because, you know, I think it's I think it's really ambitious and really interesting that uh, this is a direction you're going in. Not a lot of studios would. I mean, it's also a dream of a lot of studios to say, like, we want to make our own original stuff, but we have all this overhead. We have a production schedule. Like, it's hard to take time away from that when we're constantly mm -hmm. trying to, like, oil and keep the machine running to make our own stuff. So, Tell me about how this is possible and, you know, also why, and just, just tell me about Make Originals. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, so to go back, uh, I mean, at Make, we always did internal projects. Uh, yeah. Probably every year we would do at least, I don't know, three to five minutes of stuff. It could either have been a big short, uh, a few PSAs. Uh, there was the one year where we did almost, 
almost nothing other than the May Gallery, where like every week we would post like an original, like, you know, 15 second animation. And like, well, boy, if you take uh, 50 of those times, uh, you know, 10, 15 seconds, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of content right especially when they're all different styles so we always kind of had that in our dna if you will like that was okay. just something we always did but then like i said in the last couple of years when we're like we want to really be able to uh put more meat on the bones of some of these things and we want to be considered as some as a company and a studio that creates these worlds creates these characters and can bring all this stuff to life properly uh, that's when we decided to, okay, we're going to take all the effort from these other things and we'll focus them on what we now call make originals, which are basically what we call uh, micro short series. So a uh, micro short in my mind is like something that's less than like a minute, a minute and a half, maybe like max for length, and then do multiple of those. And that's how you can get like a like a small, like small show essentially, but instead of it being 11 minutes, like what you would see on TV or something like that, you get 30 seconds, a minute maybe. So it's kind of like the, the comic strip version of a, it is what a comic strip is to a comic book. This is to a regular series that you would see on TV or, or, or streaming or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the idea is, first of all, it's a lot of fun. Like it's something that's really interesting. Uh, it's, forces us to do a lot more writing and concepting right the, one mm. of the things that we're like we want to tell people like we do this kind of work and either we understand what you're trying to do or we can do the original scripts and whatnot um and i think it's just a way to have purpose and reason behind all the things that we're doing and hopefully Again, they're 2D, they're 3D. We're doing a lot of different things. They're funny, they're uh, dramatic. Uh, all of them have been kind of funny so far, but soon we're going to start having ones that are a little more like dramatic or scary or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's a way for us to explore, just to continue exploring, but still with kind of like an, like an umbrella essentially, right? Like it's all yeah. under... Um, it's all under something. So you can put an identity to it. It totally makes sense. You know, <clears throat> it's fun to do. It keeps things interesting internally. You're putting out super creative stuff. It's a sales tool for your commercial work and storytelling. Do you, do you foresee a future where sh make originals becomes more than, you know, these fun micro shorts? Like, would you fully produce a show or sell it as a show? Like what if it takes off? Like, a, uh, like sure. one of them yeah. takes off for instance. Uh, so I personally don't have aspirations to create a show. Um, that's just a lot of minutes yeah. of the same work. And I really enjoy, like I mentioned earlier, right, 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 right. bouncing between different projects and different styles and all of that. So I think if anyone asks us to do, you know, 20, 20 some episodes uh, of 20 some minutes, that that's, that's too much. I don't want to do that, but I would love to create like a micro short series that maybe acts as a pilot for a show that somebody else goes and produces. Uh, okay. I think that would be totally fair. Um, we actually did that by accident with one of our very first micro short series that we did like 15 plus years ago. We You're had talking like about the glumpers? We're talking <laughs> the glumpers, yes. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, that got sold and turned into like a hundred. Uh, oh, wait, wait, tell me. So, okay. Tell me about how that happened. So you were just for fun animating these little uh, uh, <laughs> monster. Well, we'll call them characters. Let's just characters. call them characters. They're dudes. Let's just call them characters. Uh, yeah, we were just, those were the original micro shorts, right? I mean, that when we decided to go back to do that, I was just kind of like, when I was trying to find that identity, I was like, well, shit, I had it you know, over 15 years ago when we did right. Glumpers, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. was something that was kind of different back then. And no, I don't say that no one, but it's not that common uh, today still. So if we like doing that, what if we did it again, but consistently and with, uh, and with purpose. Okay. Um, so yeah, those were created for shorts or five, five shorts. Um, 
And then a company bought them and turned them into, yeah, like a hundred three minute episodes. And they all kind of follow the same format as the first five episodes. Just they like, didn't even, they didn't even bother trying to try to expand. the Glenn Well, it's universe. funny because it's like, it, they're all, they're, they're for the most part, not all, but for the most part, they're kind of like remixes of like the scenarios, like what happens to this character? What happens to that character? And it's like, but they're all funny. They're, they all like, you know, it works out really, really well. Uh, so, you know, if somebody wanted to do that with one of our uh, IPs, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, and who knows, you know, things change, maybe turns out in a couple of years, I'm in a place where we do a property, it takes off. I love it so much. I'm like, you know what, yeah. guys, we can make uh, 50 of these a year, you know, it's okay. Like, it'll be, it'll be worth it. There's like enough here to kind of keep that interesting. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not well, writing anything. You didn't want to grow your, past, your studio past 25, but here we are. So who knows? So you, but you've already, you've already produced a whole bunch of these make originals and they're, you know, you can go on YouTube and watch them, et cetera. You know, what, what has, uh, what's been the result so far from, from them? Um, so, so far is it's been pretty nice, actually. Um, it's funny because we've had, uh, we've had, a we've, we've had studios that, we would want to have them hire us to do work, want us to hire them to do work on make originals. Okay. Uh, okay. That's the opposite. Of what <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's not, it's not helping in any way whatsoever. <laughs> but what I like about that is uh, what that means is, is that the quality of the projects and the way that yeah. they're being presented is clearly kind of polished enough, uh, feels like there's enough scope to it that people are kind of taking notice of it and they're kind of saying like, oh, we want to be involved or we want to be part of uh, what is getting created here. Um, it's a, we're, you know, we're showing the, that work when we're pitching to commercial clients and they're loving it. They're, they think that this stuff is like great and hilarious. And it kind of shows again, another dimension of the kind of work that we just, you know, normally wouldn't have in our reel because there wouldn't be a, there would be a reason uh, to get it made. Um, we've created a lot of connections with new artists because even though Make as a studio rarely works with freelancers when working on commercial work, um, we're definitely doing that more with Make Originals. So creating those kinds of connections and meeting new people is uh, has been really great with that. And uh, yeah, just kind of getting out there and being part of uh, kind of tangentially related entertainment industry has just been really interesting because there's all sorts of other influences and inspirations and kind of cultural learnings to be had from that. So it kind of makes you think differently about the work that you do. So again, I think that that'll be great for Make Originals because it'll make our Make Originals better. And I think it'll also be interesting to see how that uh, influences the Make commercial work as well. And I really hope that they genuinely kind of feed each other essentially like it's not like one of them is for the other's sake but it's we kind of think of it as something more uh cyclical right they're both feeding each other hopefully kind of creating like really nice feedback loops makes sense makes sense um <clears throat> another question i just have with the make originals you know there's a lot of uh seo and trending and algorithm stuff to hit on like youtube or tiktok or mm -hmm. You know, all the, you know, as an artist, you want to make your own creative things. And then when you do and nobody watches it, you're like, well, it's because I didn't, I don't know, I didn't hop on the right things. Like, is is that yeah. a consideration in these originals as well? So right now, no, it's actually okay. not. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, ca I'll caveat it with one thing. Broadly speaking, no. I'm not trying to chase trends or I'm not like, oh, uh, people are doing dancing hot dogs. Let's do uh, dancing uh, broccoli or something because that like dancing, that sounds awful. <laughs> dancing <laughs> things are so hot right now. Right. I, I don't want to do that. That's not in my mind the goal. Like this has to be something that is um, genuine to us. Yeah. For it to matter. Um, and I again in the future maybe it'll be different but right now I think we need to kind of find what we bring to the table 
And that's where you have to kind of just keep your fingers crossed to be like, well, hopefully we're in the right place at the right time, or we're doing something that is just, it's good enough that it'll cut through. Yeah, it's not hitting on any of the specific trends, but it's definitely has like the kind of appeal that people will like. Uh, right. The caveat that I want to say is, is that we're still doing it on YouTube. So I don't want to be completely like, um, again, like adversarial to the platform. So there are some things where it's like, you know, on YouTube, do like slow burn type jokes work? Not really. That's one of the things that we actually did find is that we actually do like slow burn type jokes where it's like you hold on something for almost like an awkwardly long amount of time and then you pay it off. But boy, on YouTube, uh, when you look at the statistics, it's like slow burn. I'm bored. Move on to the next thing. Oh, and you're no, like, what, really? The joke. <laughs> Is there not even like five seconds worth of patience? So, you know, there's some projects where if the format calls for like something that's very short and quick and comedic, yeah, we have to be hitting jokes at a certain at a certain rate. Uh, but if we're committing to doing something that's more like horror thriller that does involve building tension and whatnot, uh, maybe there were just like, sorry, audience that wants to, you know, very quick, like bite size, like, you know, laugh every five seconds. This isn't the content for you. Uh, hopefully the next uh, IP is more, yeah. more in line. And I know that it's not the most effective way of doing it, but you know, you can't, uh, I, I, the minute you're doing exactly what like an algorithm or some other kind of external force demands, you're now, it's turning back into like work. It's turning back right. into someone is telling you how to do it. And I want to find a way to do something that can be good enough that people want to see, but still satisfying to us. And yeah. hopefully we learn something along the way to, you know, find a good kind of, um, I don't know if middle ground is the right word because that feels like a compromise. I want to find a way for those things to coexist. It of makes sense to chasing me. Chasing one or the other. And if if it was work, what, do you just go back to commercial work then instead of doing this? Oh, well, we're not, you know, not doing be... commercial work. But we're I mean, like, doing that. you know, if you turn your shorts into trying to play to a client, then it's might as well just do commercial work where you're getting paid to do it versus trying to get an algorithm to maybe give you some. Yeah, to a certain extent. AdSense uh, or whatever. I, I will say, like, one of the things that getting more and more into this entertainment and creating IP and stuff like that, if there's really kind of one lesson that I think you realize very, very quickly is that anything that you make there, it has to come from you in some way. And by you, I don't like, I don't mean me necessarily, but it could be like any one of the people at the studio or one of the people that we're working with outside of the studio that we like what they do. Um, it has to come from them. So that's where the the genuineness the sincerity of whatever that creation is if it's not that it's going to feel totally. um ham-fisted i i think i think people can tell that and i'm noticing that now more and more that you can always when you see something if it's not good it's usually because it's kind of generic like there's just something there that's like well it could have been this it could have been that who cares yeah. but the things that are really good you can probably go talk to the creator and they'll explain all the things you liked about them. This is why we did them. This is what I experienced. This is what I went through. This is based on like a memory or I don't know, yeah. any one of those things. And I think that there's there's something there. There's an intangible. It's kind of like when you see AI art, you know, and it looks beautiful. It's having the it, exact same thought, but, but it you don't feel anything. There's, there's no something missing there, right? Because yeah. it's like a nice, smooth averaging of, you know, it's just, it, it just misses the, the, the genuine, authentic uh, reason. And I think when we find something that we like, it's because we're connecting with that thing. And that's something I never, like these are, the, this all of these sentences I just said, I never even thought about this up until, you know, maybe like a year or so ago. Well, it's because you just that, started making, make originals. You were working on other stuff. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, you know, I pitch a lot of shows to, to studios, et cetera. And I'm always having this conversation because the, 
they really like what I've put together, but then we start having a conversation about how they want to change it for the demographic. And then it just becomes this, uh, like not super generic, but it loses the heart of what they enjoyed yeah. in the first place. And then trying to explain that to them, it's super tough. Yeah. yeah. Well, because <laughs> but, they don't feel it, right? They don't yeah. feel like they feel it broadly. Yeah, they feel they that understand. they like the idea. Yeah, they, they don't, don't know what get part why of they it. liked it exactly. It's, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially when I have this conversation with stop motion when I'm, you know, pitching Silly Duck Wizard. The first, you know, studio executive X Y Z will say, "I love it. I love in stop motion. Can we do it in two D instead?" And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. "Then it's not the, you know, yeah. we can, but it, you won't love it as much, and people won't connect yeah. with it anymore because yeah. it loses a whole bunch of the soul of it." Yep. So yeah, and and exactly what you said about AI art. I mean, like, you know, um, somebody on my Facebook posts a, their AI creations every single day. And it's really impressive what they come up with. And like, sometimes I study the image to be like, what can I find wrong in this? Is the lighting off? And today I, you know, I was looking at a picture of a car in a showroom. The lighting mm -hmm. was great. Perspective was great. Everything, like everything was perfect. I couldn't find something wrong with it, but I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't yeah. connect with the picture. Because so you, well, you may like it, but you won't love it. I won't love right? it. Yeah, yeah. I'm That's not gonna like difference. think about. Other than I couldn't find anything wrong with it today, I'm not gonna think about it later. Yeah. So yeah, I hundred percent, hundred percent agree with you, and oh. and uh, I think that. I just want to. I have a. I have a point about that that I think is very. I mean, it's, it's obvious, right? But it's like, have you ever seen that thing where they take uh, a bunch of like pictures of faces? and then average them yeah, together, right? And then you end up with like that average person Perfect. is essentially everyone finds that person attractive, but no one thinks that person is beautiful, right? Right? Because what happens when you average all the features together is like, there's nothing weird. There's nothing bizarre, nothing about it. Like the, that person's face is just perfectly lovely, right? It's nice, yeah. right? But if you look at the people that are considered beautiful people, like they have weird things about them, but there's something about those weird things, you know, like yeah. extra pointy chin, big mouth, something about the eyebrows, right? Like that isn't average, but when it all comes together just right with their personality and the place that they are, they're then considered beautiful. I, I think actually, that that's what AI art is missing. AI art, AI art is the average of it. So it's yeah. going to look great. You're at the, you're going to look at these pictures and you're like, yeah, beautiful lighting, beautiful composition. All of this is great. But you're like, but I want like something discordant in here. That is the thing that will like draw my eye to it. And that's how I know that that's the thing that matters. That is, I don't know if it's always going to be missing, but it's so far has been. I mean, I I totally agree with you. I also think that the average audience doesn't have enough fine tuning to care too much, unfortunately, when it comes to these things. Right. Um, so but yeah, hundred percent agree with you. You know, uh, and I think that's what is going to stand through time. It always has. Is you know, art exists because of the human mm -hmm. element and what we find is beautiful, etc. Yeah. Um, now there, I, I will say the the only thing about that is there will be a whole field of content that whatever the AI generates will be perfectly fine for, right? Totally. So if you think of like, you know, there's like some preschool kid stuff that right now is, you know, super, I mean, it probably is practically like- And AI can probably educate them better than a whole team of <laughs> yeah. uh, childhood consultants, you know? I'm just, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying you were not more than like a couple of years away from being able to tell AI, hey, uh, give me a rendition of the wheels on the bus uh with like a banana and a broccoli on uh like a school bus made out of like a milk carton or something and it'll do the whole thing and it'll look just as good as anything you can find on youtube that is the nursery rhyme like quick yeah quick Coca -Melon. Beta, uh, kind of a thing <laughs> yeah so it's like there are things that are at risk the things that are kind of lower threshold Totally. are going to get completely automated and i well, any that creative industry cool. like you listen to music in the elevator well in the elevator but in the grocery store or like on a commercial and i think all those are going to be completely a ai generated and a animation lot of it is going too. to yeah but i don't know i i, I think there's going to be a point where you know we're all watching our own customized tv shows because an ai just knows who you are and just makes a i don't know makes so a that, show so based on no, your interests that, so i think no that i think is not going to happen right you don't think so I, not for uh conscious people 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, but here, you know. So here's the thing, because like, yeah. you know, the younger generation is growing up with this as it it's a normal thing for them already. Yeah. So they're just going to be, you know, this is normal. This is the, these are the TV shows that I watch that are already just AI generated for me. Mm -hmm. These are the, maybe the HBO shows that are a higher quality written by people. That I, so I here's the thing. I don't, so here's why I don't think so, because I think the point, so I think two things. One, I think uh, I'd had a conversation about someone about this yesterday. It may have been yesterday. Um, I, I was telling someone that was a story artist, I was like, because I was talking about AI a little bit at, uh, at a, well, actually at MCAT. And uh, I was kind of telling the story artist that because she was really nervous about uh, AI taking her job or her not even job, like her future job, essentially. And I was kind of like, I think story artists are probably the last people that will fall to AI, if ever. Because the whole point of it, uh, what I said earlier, which is people want to watch something because they connect with it and it means something. And if I just say, uh, you know, hey, Google, uh, generate a detective story about, you know, some a sci-fi detective story for me to watch. It's going to be something, but you're not going to connect with it. You're going to be like, meh. You're just not going to want to watch it. I mean, there's really good content now that people don't connect with. Why would yeah. we expect them to connect to the AI version of that? That's I fair. don't think that. So I don't think that's going to happen to people that if they have to choose what to watch, they're going to choose the thing that they connect with. And I think uh, the way that I phrased it to, the, to this person was uh, the AI doesn't, a computer doesn't have a should or an ought right? Like they don't know, they can't come up with like that kind of a reason. They can take some other things reason and make something off of it, right. but they can't generate their own odd. Like why should the character do this? Why should someone want to watch it kind of a situation? And I think that the humans are just kind of complex enough and have enough experiences as like a starting point that we can create the, we have odds to why we create what we do. And then hopefully somebody else likes that, right. essentially. Uh, and I think that, I'm not saying it'll never happen because, you know, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, who who knows, right? But in like the immediate future or the near near future, I just don't see how that gets replaced. Um, yeah. I think that that's the hardest thing. And that is kind of the thing that we're pursuing as a studio because I partially feel like if we can find that it, right? If we can totally. be the people that can have the right set of oughts and shoulds that will appeal to people and create something interesting, uh, we can keep up running the automation that is always kind of behind you, essentially. I mean... Do you see yourself ever reaching a point where, like, say you have a story artist and the story artist uses AI to, you know, um, yes, yes, where they have a cinematic scene, they want it from a different perspective, AI generate a character yes. standing in the background from a top, uh, you know, bird's eye view versus a medium long, mm -hmm. like, etc. So, yes. okay, yes, yes, to all of that. Yes. Uh, AI is great at retargeting, right? Like, that's what it does the best at. You need to give it the reason, you need to give it the framework, but then it can retarget. So okay. I think that um, I don't know if we're going to have a much smaller industry because you don't need as many artists in order to get something done, or if it just means that there will be that much more stuff getting done by fewer and fewer people. The reality is, is that's already happening, right? Yeah, your story artist is also your writer, is your is oh, your animatic I don't mean, Sorry, sorry, I, I don't mean it like that. He, let me give you a better example. Um, I was at uh, Lightbox a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah. And um, he, there was a pipeline uh, supervisor that was talking about kind of the uh, evolution of their uh, lighting tools going from like uh, Monsters, Inc. to uh, Incredibles 2 and beyond, right? And I don't know if most of the people today remember what it was like to light 20 plus years ago, but 
you had to put a light for every single thing. So if you wanted to have a reflection from the floor, you needed to shine a light to be that color. And if there was like a red thing over here, you needed to shine a red light. And if you had a candle, you had a little yellow light and everything was layers and layers and layers of lights. Everything had to be manually done. You had teams of people lighting movies and they, you know, uh, they still weren't photoreal, but they had a lot of like nice touches and everything. And yeah. then today you can have one person runs in, uses some domes, uses GI from the environment, adds a couple of lights and then kind of tweaks them around a little bit. And you can get much better results with a lot less time, a lot less work, a lot less people. But there aren't any less people working today than were working 20 years ago, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm not a you know the they took our jobs kind of a thing. Like I'm I'm not afraid they changed of changed our jobs maybe. That yeah, it's I feel like it's always been they changed our jobs because there's more people working today than we're working ever before. And it keeps always changing like that. We automate this, we automate that, we computerize this, we mechanize that. We're going to AI certain things. And I think that what's just going to happen is, is it's just the same thing. It's not just the same thing, but there is definitely a parallel here between um, how hard it was to do something before and how easy it is to do now, but you yeah. don't see all like oh now two people light a movie and you know you don't need anybody it's like no the quality just goes yeah through the roof right like stuff is incredible now versus 20 some years ago so what you're going to have is is instead of someone being like okay uh we got notes from the director uh yeah he wants to change the angle on the shot it's not working all right guys bring the camera bring the lighter bring the now we're seeing different models or different whatever and like the whole thing blows up. Now it's like, all right, here's what the scene looks like. Uh, AI retarget the camera to be from like a higher vantage point. And maybe it just, you know, processes that for, you know, a couple of hours and now you get a new shot. Um, that is good for content creation. That's not a negative. Um, as long as you still have people making choices at the beginning and have reasons for why they're making their those choices. So I think that's really what uh, everyone should be kind of thinking about as we yeah. kind of move forward. Makes sense. As a studio owner, and what you just said is, you know, the quality keeps improving, uh, jobs change, roles change, tech changes. How do you keep, you know, <laughs> you, technology is sprinting behind you and you're jogging ahead. How do you keep making sure that you are staying ahead of all this or on top of all this because you know it seems like there's a lot on your shoulders you said you're running the strategic you know path with consultation from uh, senior employees you know of the company you're trying to keep on top of all these trends you're going to conferences like you know how do you how do you personally manage all this and make sure that you're like what if, what if one day like i don't know you just have a revelation you're like I'm just going to stay as is, or I'm going to stop. Like what happens to make or oh. what happens to. Uh, well, I think for me personally, I like learning new things. I like incorporating new approaches. Yeah. I like doing, I like to me, the, there were maybe a couple of years back in like 2017, 2018, where we didn't really change that much. We kind of, I call it, we coasted for a couple of years. I, still think, years. I, I mean, I feel like our coasting years were still like pretty intense and we still did a lot of stuff, okay. but there wasn't like, um, there wasn't like kind of growth. Uh, and when I say growth, it doesn't mean people, right? It just means. It means yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. What The people growing, not uh, physically adding more space or more people. Uh, and that was probably the least enjoyable years that I ever had uh, doing this from the beginning until wow. now, because I love learning new things. I love doing new types of projects um, and incorporating a new tool into the pipeline or seeing that there's like a new way of doing something and being able to kind of figure that out or just. And by, by figure out, I'm not saying I have to figure it out now. Sometimes it means, hey, right. you figure it out. And then someone You're not else, super you know, scared of falling behind that. the curve and becoming, you know, a studio that's, uh, we used to do good work. And now, yeah. yeah, I, I feel like I would be, I would feel bad before that even happened. Like I would hmm. feel that already. Now, to be fair, 
uh, whenever you're a student, you have an established pipeline, you're almost definitionally not optimal. Like there are better, like if you come in fresh, you're like, okay, what's the best way of doing this now? And let's do it that way. You don't have any like legacy code, okay. like yeah, built yeah. into like what you have you're to doing. do this workaround thing because so-and-so's computer is old and they require this They're... file. I don't know. <laughs> no, we have great computers. Do All our computers not... are amazing, but we have amazing computers. No one has shitty computers. Uh, <laughs> uh but the the no no i think the the thing is is like you know it's like the the type of software you use do you use plugins are there things that you've like kind of hard coded into your pipeline because the bigger you are you kind of start coding in pipeline tools and they kind of force you into doing something a certain way and yeah. if a new way comes in it may not plug into that necessarily so there's definitely some things where when i look at them i'm like well you know we're kind of doing it the older way and of course if you've been an artist doing this for like 10 15 years you're kind of used to doing it the old way and you know the what's new that comes out with every piece of software you you've you don't care about that anymore you're right. like if there's like a big feature maybe i'll play around with that but like the little ones uh i, no, got, I remember I can, the I can excitement already... of opening up a 3d studio max fresh and having no clue what anything is and just playing around with everything versus like now i don't even i don't know what I'm, i've gone back to hand drawing <laughs> yeah so so yeah i you know there there is that but i think as long as that isn't um you know you have some yeah, of that yeah. but the the main thrust is wanting to learn gotcha. wanting to improve wanting to do better and if there's places that you're not doing better at least you're self-aware of them and you're you don't wait you ought to wake up one day and realize oh shit for the last five years we've been doing this thing like completely wrong like you you need to have a good reason to not want to have that like Totally. small totally. pain in order to have like a really good benefit on the other side. That makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I have one more question to ask you. And and you kind of mentioned it a couple of times before you're thinking of growing the studio a little bit bigger. You're working with freelancers, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're getting involved with more artists and people. Is there, and also, I don't know if you want to talk about nice moves, but you're also involved in, in that and mentorship and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So is there a way that you're looking to, get involved with more people or advice for more people to get involved with you or uh yeah so one of the decisions we made at the you know couple years ago or a year or two ago when we we're like this is what we're going to be doing with the studio one of those pillars was community right it's like we want to be involved we don't want to be kind of just insular we're just doing our own thing and you know we don't care about other people if people don't care about us i really felt like we needed to kind of break out a little bit more and get out there. And that comes in a lot of different ways. So for me personally, yeah, kind of being a director at Nice Moves and, you know, kind of working with the community uh, here in uh, kind of the Midwest, you know, mostly Minnesota, kind of neighboring states kind of a situation uh, and kind of promoting animation and motion graphics and visual effects. Uh, you know, hopefully inspiring uh, students or people that are just getting into the industry and providing them with ways to, um, you know, interact with other people in the industry. So like, that's great for me on a personal level. Uh, but then my personal interest in kind of giving back and doing that, and as far as the studio comes uh, into, we do a lot of workshops. So we do kind of commercial animation workshops. We use social media kind of workshops uh, that focus on animation, motion graphics, and visual effects. Um, you know, going to events, doing portfolio reviews, giving people okay. kind of advice and stuff like that. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, and I think, you know, it helps people to kind of get both the perspective of someone that uh, has been in the industry for a while, does recruiting, and works in kind of an industry that maybe isn't an industry that everyone thinks about first off, right? Most people are like, I want to get into animation. I want to go to Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks, right? And they don't really think like, so people don't even realize that there's a bunch of people that make all the commercials that are right. on uh, Twitch or whatever, right? Oh, and, Disney doesn't uh, make those? <laughs> yeah. So um I think giving people like insight into that, because I think that there's like a whole group of people that would thrive in commercials or sh short form animation kind of in general, uh, because they 
want to do a little bit more than be like a specialist yeah. at a larger studio. So I think giving that, doing that and having that awareness. And of course, uh, you know, we talked about make originals, working more with people outside uh, the studio. I think, again, that's important so that we have connections with other people. We kind of get uh, some artistic inspiration from people that aren't just kind of here and doing what we're doing. So those collaborations, I think, help a lot. Um, with that aspect. So it's just when you're out there and you're interacting with other people, I mean, you know this, you're interacting with people all the time uh, in this uh, in this function and you, you learn things that you wouldn't have learned if you didn't talk to them, right? So sometimes you just talk to someone and they say something and it like something clicks and you're like, holy yeah. shit, I, now I, a whole new region of the map is like um, you know, outside of the you know fog of war because I just understood this concept that like, if I would have talked to someone like this, I never would have known. I'm going to uh, say treat own. networking like fog of war from, <laughs> that's a good yeah. analogy though. Like, you know, there's the saying, you don't know what you don't know, but like fog of war is more of a visual, a visual media visual thing. That makes sense. Yeah. You want to put a pylon out there uh, so that you have some vision. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I, so I, I just think that it's, it, I think it's good. I think it's good for us as uh, artists. I think it's good for us as a studio, and I think it's um, it's fun for me just as a as a person who spent so much time just kind of like in the studio doing work and supervising work and directing work and not really uh, being able to get out there and interact with people that much. You're uh, this all sounds amazing, but I'm just wondering: Are you working like 14 hour days? <laughs> <laughs> not anymore uh that sounds this yeah. all sounds like a lot managing a studio making originals doing community stuff jumping on random podcasts um yeah i mean i think one of the really awesome things that happens uh and i think this is something that uh, people that run studios um feel like they need to do everything uh they feel like they can do it the best or they feel like they know exactly how they want it and they can might as well just do it themselves and uh, that is an impossible way of doing something past a certain scale. So you need to start having other people that can do stuff as well. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, I go to some schools and then other people from the studio that want to kind of do the same kind of interaction, they go to other schools. So we can kind of have more of a presence that way. Yeah. And maybe at some point I'm like, ah, I don't want to go to schools anymore. Like I'm bored of this. Like right. I want to take a break this year. You guys go to the schools this year and then I'll be like rejuvenated uh, next time or something. So spreading the load, uh, having other people and preferably other people that are probably better than you at that task. Uh, that's what you want to find. You want to find people that are going to be complimentary like they understand the vision and they know what you want to execute but they also have what they bring to it and they can kind of teach you like you learn new ways to do it based off of their experiences and their ideas so that's how you can scale up and that's how you can you know you only have to make certain decisions and you have to put things in place and then even more gets done okay my last my last question you're a small studio, well, 30, 30 people, whatever. Small to mid-size now. Right, right. Mid small to mid-size. Um, well, I'm just thinking like from my business background, like a small to medium company is <laughs> totally different. Um, well, yeah, compared to Target, <laughs> we're, we're a small company. Yes. Right, small company. So yeah. every hire you have is super important. I'm just wondering, you know, you mentioned a lot of things where you have to trust other people and give uh, they, the, you know, they have the same vision as you, but bring new things. Is it really tough to hire uh, somebody to bring into the culture that you've created? Um, I think it depends. So I think it's tough to find people that like instantly click that are like they, everything about them is like great. Like, okay, yeah. you're, you're just, you're nailing every single thing on every part of it. Um, because some people are just going to have, again, like I said, their own kind of, they bring their own background and they bring their own personalities. So for me, the way I look at it, it's not so much, does the person immediately plug in and do everything kind of exactly the way that I want them to do? Um, it may sound weird, but I sometimes want someone to come in and be a little bit of a thorn in my side. Like mm -hmm. 
someone that is going to challenge me a little bit is something that I also value. So as long as I feel like um, they have a good head and they're they're overall upping our game, I think that that's kind of what matters. And I think that you can usually identify relatively easy okay. in someone. How exactly it plays out, not always, but um, I'll go back. I actually used this analogy uh, recently and it fits perfectly in our conversation here. I was saying the same way that like in a show, there was something about like the idea that was originally very appealing and you want, even if the show ends up being a little bit different it from what, what the initial pitch was, as long as it maintains like the the core, the heart of the idea, it'll probably be a good show, right? If the character design changed a little bit, if they added like a different another sidekick, if they, you know, they changed the location a little bit or all these kinds of things, that's fine. If you look back and you're like, what was the, what were the pillars of this deck? Here's the three pillars. Are those in the show? Yes. Okay. So then we probably are going to keep the heart of it. I feel like when you hire a person or an artist, um, um, artist person, uh, you there if there's something there that when you talk to them, when you saw their work, if there was something that you're like, I like this person, or I feel like they would do something, like they, they have something about them that is really good. How exactly that manifests, you don't know, but if you can bring whatever that initial feeling was, that initial insight throughout their process, throughout their integration into the studio, I think what they end up doing may be a little bit different and how they do it may be different from how initially envisioned, but it's going to work out really well and maybe even for the better. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense to me. I, 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 it's, I think your thorn in the side approach is especially interesting because a lot of people I've talked to, you know, and, and even I've worked for a company where we had a very long, extensive hiring process because we had such a tight knit team that we didn't want to mm -hmm. break the mold. But I'm wondering how things would have been different if we just kind of trusted that the, the person's skills and who they are would contribute in a positive way while also challenging what we've built mm -hmm. to create something better. So yeah. I think that's a, I mean, you know, every company has a different way of operating and that I'm, that was just a interesting. Point. You know, I, I think it's kind of like uh, we were talking about it a lot earlier there, there have been uh, situations in my life in the past where I, again, I, you know, I thought I knew, I thought I knew Yeah. whatever it was. I thought I knew it. Right. Yeah. And it took, uh, something changing or breaking or some kind of event to sometimes realize, wait, uh, shit, I was wrong. Right. I, you know, the other person was right. I was the wrong one here. What did, what did I do? Like, why was I like this kind of a thing? And I could explain why I was like this, but you know, you kind of, you feel like, ah, I wish I knew now what I, I knew then what I know now. Listen, um, if your life isn't, if you're not always saying that throughout your life, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, to a certain, right, to a certain extent. So I think like when, if you, if you have enough of those kinds of moments where you realize that, then you realize that if someone has like a good head and they have a good agenda and they're seeing it differently from you, you have to understand why. Yeah. And you have to kind of confront that you because if you're just like, oh, whatever, they don't know what they're talking about. It's like, well, no, you you hired them. They must know something about what they're talking about. So that challenge sometimes makes me reevaluate my preconceived notions. And then sometimes I do that. And then I realize, well, shit, I guess there was something here. Good thing that we good thing that we did that instead of just you know, doing uh, essentially the version of coasting, right? Doing the same thing that yeah, I always yeah, did yeah. because that's how I always wanted to do it. Hey, and that you you spent two years doing that in 2017, 18 and hated yeah. it. So here you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you bring in people, they challenge you, so, you know, and it's it's usually for the better. You may not go 100% towards where they go, where they want to go, but usually it involves some kind of, uh, yeah. you know, finding a, finding like, okay, I see what you want to do. I see why I want to do it this way. 
how do we kind of, again, not like find an awkward middle ground, but how do we like make these two things like fit together? And maybe that is actually the best way uh, moving forward. That's what I hope usually. Totally. I mean, that makes 100% sense to me. Um, well, Danny, we've talked about a lot of things over this chat. Is there anything we missed that you wanted to bring up still? <laughs> um, you know, I can probably keep talking about this stuff for hours and hours. Uh, maybe we will leave this for, uh, for a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe YouTube uh, is the wrong platform to post this on if, if, if it's a slow burn. <laughs> I don't know, I was trying to make a joke. It didn't really work, whatever. <laughs> um okay well, i think we can we cover i think we cover yeah, some we ground I, well is there anything you know is there anything that uh you want to leave on if somebody's listening and you know especially maybe they're another alternate studio owner small to medium sized trying to figure things out and that you i feel you like know i i otherwise. think you know the thing the the things that we talked about, like if there was any kind of like thing that clicked for you as you were listening to this, you're know, like, oh, that's that's quite interesting. Um, you know, explore it. Uh, and like honestly, if you want to like reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn and chat about it or ask about it, like I want to help people and have people uh, be able to, uh, you know, maybe uh, shortcut some of the oopsies yeah. that uh, I made along the way. So I'm happy to do that. Um, nice. LinkedIn nice. is an example of one of those things that I was totally against until someone was like, "No, you really need to do this." And now it's like one of my favorite things. So against you know. LinkedIn, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, well, that's fine. I mean, I'm I'm against at the, the at the time I at the time I I don't know if "against" is the right word, but like uh, d yeah, dis didn't they, uh, dismissed uh, it or thought uh, who has time or who cares or whatever, yeah. and now. I make so many connections there. I've talked to so many people. I love seeing what people are doing. I think it's uh, like, it's kind of like if you took the best of Facebook and the best of Instagram and kind of put it together and just, you know, I currently, I love it. You know, uh, if you're listening to this in like three years and LinkedIn has gone to shit, uh, don't hold it against me. This is dated, uh, November 15th, 2023. So, okay. <laughs> and, and this has been recorded this on has November been 15th, recording. 2023. Right. So, you know, don't, don't, don't hold me to, to I mean, all social media is going to shit anyways. I used to think Facebook was amazing. And now, now, <laughs> yeah, things, things change. Things change. All right, Danny. Well, thank you so change. much for coming on the chat. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we finally chatted about everything <laughs> all right awesome it was super fun and yeah. uh yeah let's do Great. it again. and if and if you're listening and you want to check out uh you know makes or danny's work through make uh, i'm going to include their website which is makevisual.com as well as their instagram which is make gallery and their originals on youtube and they have a original series um instagram channel as well so i'm going to include all those in the description of this chat so please go check them out and that's all for now so thank you so much for listening okay bye the music for this podcast was composed by Willem Mendo and the graphics by Luhan Wang. I encourage you to look them up if you've enjoyed their work.